The Game Boy Advance was a powerful little handheld for the time, and was a much bigger leap ahead from the Game Boy Color when compared to the power difference between that and the original Game Boy. Over the years, the GBA has been widely considered to be sort of a handheld version of the SNES, but the truth is, it actually outperforms the SNES in a multitude of ways, especially in its ability to run 3D games. Now, the 3D titles available for the GBA are pretty hit or miss, since it wasn't exactly designed for 3D, but quite a few developers tried their hand at pulling it off for better or for worse. Today, let's check out some impressive, and not so impressive, 3D games for the Game Boy Advance. Before we get into the video, if you watch this and you like what you see, consider subscribing. When you tap that button, it actually does more than most people realize. So if you wanna help support me and keep seeing my videos in your feed, click the button. With that out of the way, here we go. All right, first up is a game I don't hear talked about often, if at all, and that's Super Monkey Ball Jr. Now, it seems like most Monkey Ball fans agree that the first two games are the cream of the crop and that most things outside of that are lackluster at best. I have to say, Super Monkey Ball Jr. for the Game Boy Advance really surprised me. Despite being on the GBA, it's a straight up Monkey Ball game through and through. Now, whichever monkey you choose to play as is represented by a sprite, most likely to help with the frame rate, but everything else in the game seems to be 3D modeled. Having I.I. in the gang in the game as sprite surprisingly isn't even distracting either. Now, I won't say Super Monkey Ball Jr. is some kind of amazing monkey ball game, it definitely isn't, but it is an impressive attempt at pulling off monkey ball on such low-powered hardware. The controls are tight, especially when considering it's all mapped to a D-pad, and the frame rate runs at a pretty consistent and competent pace. They really didn't cut too many corners here, as level geometry can get pretty complex. There's a bunch of bananas to collect, and there's even the secret warp exits you'd expect of a monkey ball game. Now, beginner mode is pretty solid, it's easy, but considering the hardware we're working with, it's pretty good for easing you into the idea of playing Monkey Ball on a D-pad. Advanced mode is probably the fairest and most enjoyable difficulty. It's not too insane, but the level designs are just complex enough to be engaging. Expert mode, on the other hand, is ridiculous. Maybe in a console Monkey Ball game, these levels would be challenging and fair, but in this form, the level layouts ask way too much of the player with the physics you're working with. It also gets way too difficult, way too fast, and a lot of the obstacles seem to not even make sense in the context of the physics of the game. And considering you have a limited number of lives and continues, I'd avoid expert mode altogether. I couldn't even pull this off when utilizing save states. One cool thing this game has is a bunch of mini games that can be played in either single player or multiplayer, of which I was only able to unlock one of. You can unlock them with the points you earn from the main game, and what's kind of interesting here is that instead of unlocking X minigame for X amount of points, you get to sort of pick and choose which game to spend your points on like a shop. The one I unlocked was Monkey Golf, which is basically a monkey ball rendition of mini golf. I sucked real bad at it, but I think if I sat with it long enough and practiced the physics, I'd get a better hang of it. All in all, though, it's a pretty cool mode. This game packs a lot for the first attempt at a handheld Super Monkey Ball game, and on such low-powered hardware. All things considered, I think they did a really good job of translating Super Monkey Ball into GBA form, and the fact that it runs as well as it does with all these 3D environments is pretty impressive. Now, before anybody cracks their knuckles and decides they're gonna did you know gaming me, I'm aware that if we're going by technicality, these games aren't actually rendering a 3D space. We all know this by now, but for the sake of the topic of the video, for all intents and purposes, these games count as 3D. Okay. So, for whatever reason, a good amount of classic PC FPS games were actually ported to the GBA, and for the most part, they work pretty well, as well as they could, given the hardware anyway. There's a port of Wolfenstein 3D, which comparatively really doesn't take much since Wolfenstein is pretty bare bones. It's super pixelated, the draw distance is bad, and it's a bit slow, but it plays all right, and they even left in all the stuff that was censored from the SNES version, like this mustache. There's also ports of both Doom and Doom 2. Like Wolfenstein, both are a bit of a pixelated mess, and once again, it's suffers from pretty bad draw distance, but both of these ports are definitely serviceable, especially Doom 2. It's a bit faster, and the overall presentation is a bit better as well. Now, the frame rate in all three of these is honestly pretty bad, but I mean, who could blame them, really? It's freaking classic id shooters running on the Game Boy Advance. It's clear that they were doing what they could with the hardware they were working with, and these are all pretty competent and playable ports. The most impressive of the classic FPS adapted for the GBA, though, has to be Duke Nukem Advance. The difference here being that Duke Nukem is unlike the id shooters, in that it's a build engine game, which basically means that the third axis in the 3D space actually matters, and in Duke Nukem, you aren't just aiming left to right anymore. So rather than making a straight port to the Game Boy Advance, Taurus Games, who were responsible for the GBA ports of Wolfenstein and Doom 2, instead made a brand new Duke Nukem game specifically for the platform, complete with its own original story and levels. This is definitely not only the most advanced game of the bunch, but it's also the best running and best looking. The draw distance thing still exists here, but to a much lesser degree from 
from what I can tell. They even use voice clips for Duke so you can get the real Duke Nukem experience of him saying a bunch of bullshit all the time. Hail to the king, baby. Despite aiming in this game being more akin to the id games with the exclusion of the third axis from the mix, items and doors are often still located on upper planes and Duke Nukem 3D implements a jump feature which definitely adds to the depth of the gameplay. No pun intended. The game isn't particularly amazing, but it's a fun little FPS made specifically for the GBA. Unlike the other games I mentioned, it's an original experience built from the ground up instead of a neutered port, and I think that's pretty cool. I'd say it's probably worth checking out if you're a classic FPS fan. Here's another FPS for you. Dark Arena is a Doom clone. Straight up. It's a little clunky, but honestly, it's pretty fun. I wish I had a ton to say about it, but I mean, it's a Doom clone. Scour the map looking for keys to unlock doors, take out enemies of varying types while expanding your arsenal and finding secrets. It controls pretty well, and it's a pretty competent original FPS that's only available on the GBA. One big downside I'd say is that there's no music that plays during the game, which is unfortunate, but if you've ever played Quake without the soundtrack, you're probably used to this kind of thing. There is a story here, but I'm gonna be totally honest, I uh, completely checked out through the entire thing. Something about soldier training facilities and genetically engineered organisms. All you need to know is there's a bunch of bad guys and you gotta rip and tear uh, or um, cut and shred your way through each stage. One pretty cool thing I found out was that the game actually has different endings depending on the difficulty you choose. So if you play the game and you like it, it might be worth playing through the other difficulties. I mean, or you could just uh, look the endings up on YouTube. Anyway, this is a pretty decent first person shooter that's exclusive to the GBA, and it does a pretty good job of being a Doom clone. Asterix and Obelix XXL is a PAL-exclusive 3D beat-em-up slash platformer based on a French comic book series that I'm pretty surprised they were able to pull off on the Game Boy Advance. Obviously not all the assets in the game are 3D, but I think this might be one of the only instances of a developer trying to make just a straight-up 3D platformer on the handheld, and honestly, they did a good job. Well, from a technological standpoint, anyway. The game itself, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. It runs at a workable frame rate, and while the gameplay itself isn't super fast, it definitely isn't slow either, and the controls are surprisingly responsive. I'll admit it's a bit tough to look at after a while of playing it, and the game happens to be extremely long when compared to other GBA games, but what's here is really impressive, once again, from a technological standpoint. The content of the game itself, on the other hand, is pretty damn bland. Now, the game does actually shine its brightest when the player is faced with platforming challenges, but unfortunately, most of the game's runtime is bogged down by waves and waves of throwaway enemies that require no real strategy and are taken out by simple button mashing. And there are so, so many of them, and unfortunately, you actually have to fight a mass majority of them because they gatekeep different areas in each stage by implementing obstacles or doors that can't be passed until you defeat X amount of enemies. When you are faced with a platforming challenge, it's actually pretty fun, but those moments are few and far between. You can also purchase upgrades for your attacks or defense by collecting Roman helmets that are littered throughout each stage and act as the game's currency. There's also a main collectible for each stage that are usually right in plain sight, but sometimes are hidden pretty well, and collecting them counts towards completion. Now, technically, you play as two different characters in this game, and can switch between them by pressing select. Asterix has a double jump, and Obelix can move heavy objects. The problem is, this is extremely situational, and you'll really only be switching characters when faced with a tedious obstacle that requires no actual skill and only exists to pad out the gameplay. Other than that, there's literally no reason to play as Obelix since he lacks the double jump and despite being much bigger, surprisingly doesn't even have a stronger attack. All things considered, I think the game on a technical level is super impressive. It's just a shame that they had such a well-running engine here for a 3D game and wasted it on super tedious and repetitive level design. A much better game could have been made out of the ground work they set here, and I can't help but be disappointed in the missed potential. Still though, this game at least serves as a really good example of what the Game Boy Advance was actually capable of. I'd say this one is worth checking out just for the novelty alone, though if you want a real copy, you'll probably need to import it. Here's a shitty Need for Speed game. Need for Speed Porsche Unleashed is a bare bones 3D racing game where you get to drive a Porsche racing against other Porsches. I heard a couple other people say this game was decent, but I've gotta disagree pretty hard here. This sucks. The frame rate is absolutely atrocious, probably the worst I've seen out of the games I've played today, and everything is so pixelated that it's borderline impossible to be able to make out what half these environments are supposed to be. Couple all that with some of the worst draw distance I've seen on the Game Boy Advance, and I'm gonna tell you right now, that's uh, not very good for a racing game. 
Most of the time, I can't see what's in front of me, and more often than not, it's not totally clear what direction the game actually wants me to steer in. I got it right for the most part, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't crash into like 50,000 walls during the short time I played this. Outside of that, this game isn't even anything special in the content department either. You can choose your car model, color, automatic or manual, and you can choose different tracks to race on as well as change the weather condition for each, but outside of an aesthetic change, and by aesthetic change I mean a bunch of random blocky bullshit that's supposed to look like precipitation litters the screen, I don't think the weather changes actually change the gameplay. Maybe I'm wrong, but I noticed no difference in the handling of the car when I changed the weather. Not that that even matters anyway, because this game controls like shit and steering the car is so sluggish that it's like trying to walk a really big ass dog who just saw another dog across the street. This game sucks, and to be honest, this right here pretty much sums up how I feel about it. And that's all the games I checked out today. The GBA definitely wasn't known for being a 3D machine, but with a little effort, some developers actually managed to pull it off, and some of them are legitimately pretty enjoyable. I know that when I was a kid, if this was the only way I was introduced to Doom 2, I definitely wouldn't have complained. And seeing companies back then manage that kind of thing reminds me even of today of companies like Panic Button pulling off stuff like porting Doom Eternal to the friggin' Switch of all things. There's actually a few more games that fit this criteria too, so maybe it'll be a topic I'll revisit in the future. And if you have any you think that I should cover, put them in the comments. Until then, you stay classy, San Diego? Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you liked it and want to see more, there's a couple other videos right there you can check out. And if you want to see everything I upload, subscribe and then tap the bell icon. And if you want to help support the channel, I also have a Patreon right there too.